tonight, right now, with some facts. First, Donald Trump is very unpopular with black voters. That is a fact. Second, that unpopularity and the lack of supporting evidence from the White House makes Mr. Trump's latest defense of his attacks on a prominent black lawmaker very unlikely to be true. Trump claiming he's actually getting support for his race baiting. Third fact, before we broadcast any new claims from the president tonight, let's look at policy facts about his administration because it is currently pushing right now a new rule that would deny food assistance and food stamps to three million Americans. The same rule would also operate to potentially kick 500,000 low-income children off of programs that provide either free or reduced price school lunches. Now that is a huge deal for low-income Americans, white or black, rural or urban. And it's precisely the kind of domestic policy that civil rights leaders and leaders of, yes, communities of color, and yes, leaders like Congressman Cummings, have been criticizing, have been advocating against. This is the policy meat on the rhetorical bone of Donald Trump's hateful politics of 2019. It's not just what he says. It's what his federal government under his administration is doing. And because this is the beat, we have a few more facts. In March, the Trump administration pushed to slash funding for affordable housing programs in America, as well as pushing cuts to the education department, curtailing key after-school programs, ending teacher training programs, and curtailing grants for supplemental school programs. Those are government operations that are designed explicitly to lift up, to provide opportunity wherever in America, from Omaha to, yes, Baltimore. And this, we want to present to you in this news broadcast, is the policy context for Donald Trump now defending and repeating his tirade against Congressman Cummings. You have a large African-American population, and they really appreciate what I'm doing, and they've let me know it. They're so happy that I pointed out the corrupt politics of Baltimore. It's filthy dirty. It's so horrible, and they are happy as hell. What I've done for African-Americans in two and a half years, no president has been able to do anything like it. Unemployment at the lowest level in the history of our country for African-Americans. The ones that like it the best, what I'm doing, are African-American voters. I'm joined now by Mark Morial, President and CEO of the Civil Rights Organization, the National Urban League. Joel Berg, CEO of the group Hunger Free America, which does a lot of work that directly addresses what we've been talking about in cities as well as poor parts of rural America. And Danielle Moody Mills, host of the Sirius XM radio show, Woke AF. Uh, thanks to all of you for Thank being you, here. Larry. Thank you, uh, Larry. I have a few more facts I'm going to run through, but I wanted to bring each of you in first, down the line on what we just pointed out, where the rhetoric meets the policy. So uh, Donald Trump is engaging in a weapon of mass distraction. Uh, he's using race to take the focus off racial conversations, hateful conversations, to take the focus Ari, off of what you just told us, and that is that there is no comprehensive urban policy, that there's been an assault in Donald Trump's budget proposals on education programs, housing programs, uh, an assault on the fair housing rule at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, work requirements for Medicaid, draconian policy measures. Now, they align with his rhetoric, but because we're talking about his rhetoric and his untoward attacks, these things are going to some extent unnoticed, but we notice them, mm -hmm. we're pushing back on them, and we're fighting them. And the other thing, Ari, if African Americans are calling the White House, then I guess there are rhinoceroses, buffaloes, and elephants roosting on the roof of the White House. Fair. Uh, Joel, you might not look scary uh, to our viewers, and this is your first time on the beat. Um, but what you know and what you do might be scary to Donald Trump. Because he seems to want to talk about some of these problems, which I mentioned are in cities as well as in other parts of the country, as a political foil, as something to use to incite or to demean, rather than, I believe, the way you are working on them, which is we are a rich nation with a lot of people struggling to even get fed. 
Well, there's no question Trump and Republicans, frankly, for decades before him, wanted to give the nation the false impression that everyone getting SNAP, the new name for food stamps, was non-white, when the largest number of Americans getting SNAP food stamps are white. Let's pause right there. Yes. So he is trying to cut the food support for, as you mentioned, something that clearly goes to, and I'm not saying we should divide it up this way, but this is what the president is mm -hmm. trying to bait us into, a program that helps kids eat. You're saying the majority of whom are white and some of whom are black, and the main thing that unites them is they're hungry. That's correct. The states that have the highest level of SNAP food stamps participation per capita are southern states that voted for Trump. His supporters are going to learn the hard way that racism doesn't put food on the table. Mm. Not only are they taking SNAP away from three million Americans, most of whom are working, the rest are children, senior citizens, working people, people with disabilities, veterans, but they're taking food away from 500,000 kids in school meals because when you lose SNAP eligibility, you also lose school meals eligibility. It is a lose-lose, and his race baiting isn't going to change that. I mean, the reality is this, is that we've always known that Donald Trump is a racist, that his policies were going to be racist. But these people that you're talking about, the ones that have benefited from government programs, they don't care because what LBJ said many, many years ago, if you can teach the poorest white man that he is better than the best black man, then you can pick his pockets. And Donald Trump is that used car salesman that has been going around and picking the pockets of poor working class people. And he's going around and he's saying, you know what? I know that you're racist deep down and I'm just as racist as you are, if not more. And it doesn't matter that I've started a trade war and you know, and you farmer are no longer able to toil your land. It doesn't matter if I've closed the factories. It doesn't it matter that I myself has benefited from putting my ties and my clothing lines into China as opposed to American factories. None of that matters. What matters is that your whiteness supersedes everything else, and you should be celebrated for that. And that is what Donald Trump is doing on a day in and day out basis. And, and when you put it that starkly, and the question then becomes is, is Donald Trump on to something? Because he would argue he made his narrow electoral path in the Electoral College in 2016 on this kind of race baiting. And he's saying today it's working. Two things that are And, and let me, let me yeah. for you, let me put up the next fact I promise, which is you have Donald Trump saying, well, uh, African-American unemployment uh, has actually dropped. That's a piece of this. Of course, that began here, as you see, if you want to go through the history, most starkly in the turnaround after the financial crisis under Barack Obama, 9% uh, after that recession. And then I want to mention the politics. Uh, Donald Trump claiming that African American voters are happy with those attacks on Cummings we discussed. Let's look at this national poll, which is out new tonight. This is where America's at. Pollsters, we didn't write the question, but pollsters uh, asking Americans whether Donald Trump is a quote racist. 51% over half the country reporting back yes after and nearly every group of voters. You find a majority, including independents, Democrats, independents, women, whites with a college degree. Blacks, Hispanics, younger Americans, older Americans, just about every group until you sort, Mark, by a partisan ideology. So I'd say this, that, uh, uh, you know, Donald Trump, uh, his 2016 election was predicated on lower African-American turnout and the presence of a third party candidate on the left. Mm -hmm. Those circumstances are not going to be present in 2020. I predict there's going to be massive turnout because as Donald Trump stimulates his base, he stimulates the anti-Trump base equally, the anti-Trump race, those who want a different America and want a president who unites. The other thing, Donald Trump can't own 4% unemployment on his watch and not own the rats in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, the rats are yours, the rodents are yours, the gun violence is yours, the opioid crisis is yours, what do you, the failure what do you to get think? a deal in Korea and China and Mexico, Given, given your work in, in the cities and you look at what it takes to be a mayor, which is all about accountability, you just said it, you've got to own the roads, you've got to own the potholes, it's you yours, might have to sir. own the rats. And you have a president here who really acts like uh, a, a pundit. Who, who, if you believe him on his best day, who just woke up and noticed these things, he's the president. Doesn't he have more power than anyone to address any he of this? He has more power than anyone. He shirked his responsibility. And he's acting as though he's president of only part of America. He wants to handpick the counties, 
the neighborhoods, and the communities that he's going to lead. And so he's let me the bring president Dan of all of America. Let me bring Danielle in on, on, let's talk about the burbs for a second, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, there's a lot Where of... Where I'm from, so okay. let's not all pretend that only white people live in the burbs. Okay, okay. there you have it. We're, we're crushing a lot of uh, <laughs> misleading tropes tonight. Uh, the burbs, we're told, actually don't like this at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to read some quotes from suburban women. Quote, I don't like the way he talks about other people. I'm just ashamed to be an American right now. Of all the people, of the disrespect and the lies and the stuff, it's too much for me. And the way he treats people, it's horrible. Yeah, well, you know, I'm glad that these women that were asked uh, their opinions on Donald Trump and his rhetoric that are now speaking out and saying, oh, my goodness. I had one, there was one woman in that, in that report that said, you know, sometimes you just need a strong businessman, and this is how, this is how you know, business is done. And I'm saying, that's how patriarchy is done. Mm. That's this idea that you're allowed to be a jerk, that you're allowed to talk down to people and to demoralize them because that's what it takes to get the job done. So that is them being steeped in patriarchy and the other thing is that many of these women are the same they're the 53 percent that voted for donald trump in the first place and now they're surprised that he's actually who he said he was going to be so i'm glad that they are waking up but should they be applauded for it i don't think so Understood. and nor do, do you need a poll to tell you that donald trump is a racist right. i think it's great because pollsters need jobs but all you need are <laughs> eyes and ears and to be able to read twitter so then you would know that he's a racist so i think that america has to decide and white america America in particular has to decide how they want to show up and who they want to be and how they want to model their families, their children, and their future after you know, this president. Danielle, we appreciate you as a guest because you could do more than one thing. So you bring the moral clarity and the shout out to the suburbs and a little shade for the pollsters. And that, that, that's fine. Now, I want you all to stay with me on the panel because one of the other big questions that comes up is who's going to step up to Trump in person? And tonight's debate is really somewhat about who looks the part for that, whatever that means to voters. Well, we're going to show you something. If you haven't seen it yet, you got to. Uh, Donald Trump having to deal directly with a protester, calling him out for all of this. Virginia state lawmaker basically gets proverbially in Trump's face protesting at this speech in Jamestown. Right here in Virginia, your predecessors. You hear the uh, delegate there saying, and we're watching this footage, pretty powerful. You can't send us back. The sign you see there says deport hate, uh, the person here that we're about to hear from, ultimately escorted out of the event, but not escorted off the beat. I'm happy to welcome Delegate Ibrahim Samira to the beat. How are you? Excellent. How are you? Thank you for having me, Ari. Um, absolutely. We just saw that footage. I want to understand and our viewers to understand why was it important to you, uh, being a lawmaker, being able to be in that room, um, to use your freedom of speech that way? It was an extremely tough decision to go into it. Uh, this is a, a monumental uh, celebration for Virginia, 400th anniversary of democracy, not just in Virginia, but uh, in the entirety of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and here we have uh, a president uh, coming and, and uh, uh, espousing all sorts of xenophobic rhetoric, all sorts of hate. Uh, and, and we have here uh, a, a Jamestown, uh, Virginia, that stands for essentially immigrants coming uh, to the Americas in pursuit of uh, a better life. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, the uh, body that which they created uh, was supposed to be representative and democratic and upholding the values of Virginia, that which we have on our seal, anti-tyrannical. When you, when you decide to do this, uh, you're taking a risk. The president might come after you, which he did. I'm going to show that in a moment. Before I show that, uh, did you factor that in? Did you think that you could achieve something uh, by going at him directly, and, and we talk about civil rights, uh, we all know there's a rich history of direct action in this country, of the idea uh, that sometimes doing things in the same room or in front of the building or in front of the protest is different and more powerful than, than wherever else we may say them. Could you, could you give us some of your thinking about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, something that sticks in my head is uh, uh, some of my mentors would tell me for every... Uh, for Martin Luther King, for one Martin Luther King, there was a hundred Martin Luther Kings that came before him, uh, that struggled, that that failed. And uh, look, I I, uh, I worked hard in my own life. My parents have sacrificed a lot. 
Uh, my family has sacrificed in the face of poor immigration uh, policies. My father, in particular, a victim of uh, poor immigration policies of the United States, is federal government. Uh, Look, the, the, the risk is, is unbearable to think of what would happen if we uh, uh, allow Trump to just come and energize uh, his base here in Virginia when we have an election in 2019. Mm. Uh, we're looking to win. We're looking to flip the legislators blue. Right. We're looking so to, you wanted to make sure. You wanted to counter him with your own. And talk about a dramatic president. You wanted to counter him with your own message that would be seen and heard. It was heard. Uh, now, let, mm -hmm. as, let's, as promised, look at the president uh, about you. Take a look. The only problem, John, you gave the protester 100 percent of the time, and it's, I don't care about coverage. The last thing I need is coverage. But listen, hey, John, 100 percent, not one word of the speech. And, you know, we were there about the speech. Uh, the protester didn't look so good to me. I'm going to be very nice. But you gave him 100 <laughs> percent. Your response. Uh, look, the president of the United States has done this time and time again where he wants to shut down media. He acts like he's in a tyranny here. Uh, we are not progressing towards that direction. We're going to make it loud and clear uh, that our constituents here on the ground as Democratic representatives, myself included, of, of Herndon, Virginia, uh, that they are a diverse community that respects uh, uh, equity, that wants to enable more people on the margins to uplift them, uh, to give them good policy, uh, to fight against systemic discriminations yeah. of all kinds. Uh, this is what what uh, every Democrat in the country is hopefully fighting for, and this is what this is our pathway to victory I'm, I'm, in 2019 in Virginia and in 2020 uh, all across the United States. I'm about States. out of time, but the last thing I noticed is you basically confronted him over your view and your criticism uh, that he has been discriminatory and racist. And what seemed, according to his own words, to bother him was that you took some of his media time. Uh huh. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, his media time uh, is so valuable to him as, as somebody who's from Hollywood. I, I, I completely understand that to his perspective. Uh, but in reality, look, this is the time for Americans to rise of all kinds, of all types, of all backgrounds. Uh, we're here to uplift people on the margins for the betterment of everybody across the board, their health care, their, their, their pharmaceutical costs, their public health overall, their education. We're here to talk about real policy initiatives that will advance yeah. America forward for the next which 100 is, years. Which I appreciate you mentioning is something we've been we've been discussing throughout uh, the top of our show tonight on a day that, again, like other days, has been uh, stressful for the body politic. Uh, Delegate Samira, thank you so much. My thanks to Mark Morial, Joel Blurg, thank you so and much, Danielle Mark. Moody Mills, all here in New York with me. We have hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.